Good morning and welcome to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. My name is Bill Benson. I am the host of the museum's public program, First Person. Thank you for joining us today. We are in our 17th year of the First Person program, and our first person today is Mrs. Dora Clayman, whom we shall meet shortly. This 2016 season of First Person is made possible by the generosity of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation with additional funding from the Arlene and Daniel Fisher Foundation. We are grateful for their sponsorship. And I'm pleased to let you know that Mr. Lewis Smith is here with us in the audience today. First Person is a series of conversations with survivors of the Holocaust who share with us their firsthand accounts of their experience during the Holocaust. Each of our first person guests serves as volunteers here at this museum. Our program will continue twice weekly through mid-August. The museum's website provides information about each of our upcoming first person guests. And the museum's website is at www.ushmm.org. And I believe that address is also in the program that you received today. Anyone interested in keeping in touch with the museum and its programs can complete the Stay Connected card that you will find in your program or speak with a museum representative at the back of the theater. In doing so, you will receive an electronic copy of Dora Clayman's biography so that you can remember and share her testimony after you leave here today. Dora will share with us her first person account of her experience during the Holocaust and as a survivor for about 45 minutes. If we have time toward the end of the program for you to ask her some questions, we will do that. The life stories of Holocaust survivors transcend the decades. What you are about to hear from Dora is one individual's account of the Holocaust. We have prepared a brief slide presentation to help with her introduction. Dora Clayman was born Teodora Bosch on January 31, 1938 in Zagreb, Yugoslavia. Here we see Dora sitting on a park bench with her younger brother, Stravko. On this map of Yugoslavia in 1933, the arrow points to Zagreb. In this photo, we see Dora on an outing to the zoo with her parents, Solomon and Silva. Solomon ran a brush making factory and Silva was a teacher. Pictured here is Dora's maternal grandfather, Rabbi Joseph Leopold Deutsch. In April 1941, when Dora was visiting her maternal grandparents in the small town of Ludbreg, Germany invaded Yugoslavia. Ludbreg became part of a puppet state run by the Ustasha, or Croatian fascists. In June 1941, Dora's parents and her brother were arrested. Their housekeeper got baby Stravko out of prison, and from then on, Dora and Stravko were sheltered by their mother's sister, Giza, and her husband, Ludovic. On the left, we see Aunt Giza, and on the right, we see her husband, Ludovic. The photo of Ludovic was taken many years after this one of Giza. Later in the war, Aunt Giza was denounced and sent to Auschwitz, where she perished. Dora remained in Yugoslavia until 1957, and in 1958, she emigrated to the United States. We close with this portrait of Aunt Giza, Dora, and Stravko that was taken to be sent to Ludovic in the concentration camp where he had been sent. In 1957, as Dora was on her way to Switzerland, she met Daniel Clayman, who was returning to New York from a post from a year of postdoctoral study as a Fulbright scholar in India. They were married in Switzerland a year later, and together they arrived in the United States in the fall of 1958. By the following year, Dan and Dora came to Washington, D.C., and Dan embarked on a career as a researcher in medicinal chemistry at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. His work culminated in his expertise in drug development against malaria. After the birth of their two children, Wanda and Elliot, Dora resumed her education, getting degrees in French and in English as a second language. She then taught in Montgomery County, Maryland public schools, including 23 years at Bethesda Chevy Chase High School, where she headed the English as a second language department. Dan passed away in 1992. Both of their children live in the Washington area. Wanda is deputy executive director of an international association that deals with issues of transportation. Elliot is a freelance videographer and owns a video and film production company. He is married to Iona, and they have three children, ages 21, 19, and 12. After Dora retired from full-time teaching in 1999, she became active as a volunteer with this museum. Her work here consists primarily of translating material from the Holocaust written in Croatian, 
Bosnian, and Serbian. Her ongoing project is connected to the Jasenovac archive. As we will hear later, Jasenovac was a major concentration camp in Croatia. Other projects for Dora have included the translation of a booklet that accompanied a 1942 anti-Semitic exhibit in Croatia and the translation of the captions on a large archive of photographs that had been gathered during the post-World War II trials in Yugoslavia. To add to her language skills, Dora continues to learn Hebrew. Dora enjoys traveling. She has been to Israel several times where she is happy to reunite with her cousins and their families. Some of her travels are connected to learning more about the events and the aftermath of the Holocaust. She has attended several conferences of the International Organization of Child Survivors, including in Poland in 2011 when she visited Auschwitz for the first time, and in Berlin in 2014 where she was impressed by the effort made by that country to teach about and remember the Holocaust. In 2013, she traveled to her former home in Croatia. During that trip, she accompanied the director of the Jasenovac archive to the site of the concentration camp to view their exhibit. Dora just returned in late June from another trip to Croatia to attend her high school's 60th reunion. Also, she visited the small town of Ludbrig, where she spent the war years and much of her youth. Besides first person, Dora is speaking publicly more. She recently spoke to a large group in Arkansas, including a group of junior high school students who hope to collect six million pennies to represent each of the six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust. And with that, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming our first person, Mrs. Dora Clayman. Dora, thank you so much for joining us and for your willingness to be our first person today. We have a short period and you have so much to share with us, so we'll just go, go right to it if you don't mm -hmm. mind. Sure. Dora, you were, you were just three years old when World War II came directly to Yugoslavia in the spring of 1941 when it attacked, was attacked by Germany. Before we turn to the horrors of the war and the Holocaust, tell us first about your parents and their lives and their community in the pre-war years. A little bit about them. Okay. Uh, well, um, the two families, my mother's family and my father's family, did not come from the same place. Uh, my father's family um, was living in Zagreb, um, and they had come, the family had come there um, not a very, very long time ago. Um, I am not sure exactly when, but pretty much as my father was already probably in his teens, and um, there were six children in the family. Um, by the time war came, uh, the father had already passed away, but the mother, their mother was living uh, in Zagreb and um, was eventually actually interred uh, in the Zagreb cemetery, and I just, managed to visit uh, her grave. Um, so she died of natural causes. And I, uh, I think if I can just say, I think you told me that that's the only grave site you have for any member of your family. Yes, um, of that generation. That generation. That generation, right. Um, so uh, my father um, was, as, as you mentioned, um, running a, f a small factory. He um, owned it and operated it. Uh, but also in his uh, extra time, he was also very involved in um, being a cantor. They were a very uh, observant uh, Jewish family. Um, now, my mother's family, on the other hand, lived uh, in a small town of Ludbreg, which is very far north, um, uh, very close to the Hungarian border. And it was in a small, that small community that had um, not a very large number of Jews, I think about 70, 100, something like that. Um, and they had been, the, 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 the community had existed for some time, um, but they didn't have a rabbi. And so they, um, co the, co they found my grandfather um, I don't remember by what means, certainly not the internet <laughs> in those days, um, in Slovakia. And uh, he 
uh, and his um, wife and two children uh, came to live in, in, in Ludbreg. Um, they subsequently had two more children, uh, two daughters, two more daughters, um, uh, Blanca and finally uh, my mother, Silva. And my mother, therefore, was um, 15 years younger than the older, mm -hmm. her older um, sibling, Giza, who played a role later on in my life. And because Aunt Giza and, and her husband, Uncle Ludovic, played such an important role in your life, tell us a little bit about them. Well, they, um, they were both working for the Ludbrick Bank, um, and he was a director uh, of, a, of one part of it, and she was an employee. And of course, they were of different religions because Ludovic, um, like the rest of uh, that town, except for the Jewish community, for the most part, were all Catholic, mm -hmm. Roman Catholic. Um, and they, two of them fell in love. Um, he was a very important member of that community. He had not only uh, been working for the bank, but also uh, he was involved in just about everything. He was an honorary um, chairperson of the fire brigade, and he ran a, a choir and a, a chamber music group. He played the violin. Uh, he was very involved in that community. His was an unusual family in that um, most of his siblings, and there were 12 siblings, had all, except for one, preceded him in, in, in death. And so by the time war came, um, there was only uh, one sister that was still alive. Uh, everybody else had passed away. But before the war, uh, his while his mother was alive, um, even though he and my aunt were in love, they never married that. They, ne they, they did marry, but they did not marry for a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, there was no such thing as a civil marriage in, um, in Yugoslavia at that time. And, um, so only in the eyes of the church? Only in the eyes of the church, or if, she, if he had converted to Judaism, which was fairly unlikely in those days at that time, um, then they could have been married by, by the rabbi, but not, not in, they couldn't go to the um, um, city hall and get married. So eventually, however, um, in 1939, I think when things were already on the horizon mm -hmm. and they knew what was happening in Germany and so on, um, they went to Hungary and they got married uh, in a civil ceremony there. It was allowed in Hungary. To it do was that. allowed in Hungary. But one of the things that I need to mention is that even though they were not married previously, um, I don't know exactly um, what kept them from marrying for so long. And of course, I asked him many times, and he would always deny that it was the, the reason was religion. Mm -hmm. um, and he would always say, well, she was quite happy with her family, living with her family, and I was happy living with my mother, and there was no need to get married. It's, of course, a way of looking at it. But I know that uh, there was no great animosity in the families, because if I take a look at the pictures, uh, the photos, um, even the photo of uh, one of the, my mother's sister's weddings, he's always there. Mm -hmm. he, he seemed to have been sort of accepted as a member of the family, even though they were not they were not married for a period, long period of time. Dora, um, when Germany launched its attack on Yugoslavia on August 6, 1941, which of course um, was eight, roughly 18 months after the war had begun elsewhere in mm -hmm. Europe, you were away from Zagreb, with, uh, Zagreb with, on a visit with relatives in Ludbreg. Tell us what you can, what you've been able to learn about the circumstances that caused you to be away from your family at that time and what happened once the Germans came into Yugoslavia? Well, um, my uh, brother was born in 1941, in January 1941, so that was very recent from uh, the time that the war had started in Yugoslavia, which was April 6th. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't know whether it was because my mother had a baby to deal with 
or it was just an opportunity, but there were neighbors of my grandparents who had come to visit us in Zagreb. And my parents decided to send me to visit my grandparents in Ludbreg. Uh, so I have memories of being on the train that was very exciting, even though I was three. But that basically is the last time that I saw my parents uh, because I um, then, as war began, I was at my grandparents' house and um, that, was, that was how I ended up not being with my parents at the time mm -hmm. and I was not with them when they were arrested. Mm -hmm. And they were arrested um, very soon after the outbreak of um, the, the hostilities um, and taken to a uh, holding place which was in Zagreb where everybody was um, uh, basically gathered mm -hmm. before they were sent off to the, uh, to a, to a, the concentration camp. Um, and my brother, however, who was with them. Before we go to that, let me just ask you a couple other things yeah, if sure. that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, had your, with war beginning in Europe in uh, September 39, mm -hmm and Germany attacked eventually in, in April 41, Yugoslavia. Do you know if your parents made any efforts to try to leave Croatia and go elsewhere during any of that time? I don't have any, um, I don't have any um, um, notion that they did. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, I'm sure, very difficult to leave. Um, there were efforts by some people I know who left uh, for Dalmatia. Uh, Dalmatia was held by the Italians, uh, the southern part of, of Yugoslavia, um, when uh, uh, the, the, these divisions came about, uh, Germany basically ceded one part of it the, uh, to the Italians who were, in, uh, who were part of the uh, Axis. And um, uh, the Italians were apparently known to have treated Jews uh, better than either the local Ustashe, uh, the, the, who ran the so-called independent state of Croatia, who were pop which was a puppet government. Um, and so many people did go to Dalmatia. I have, a fr I have some, many friends, actually, I shouldn't say many, but I have a few friends who did do that, mm -hmm. whose family did that. And I hear that, I was told that one of my aunts, my aunt Blanca and her husband and children uh, did make it to Dalmatia. But then Pavelic, the head of the government, decreed that anybody that returned uh, would not be harmed. And so they- um, Went back home? They went back home. Uh, my parents, I have no idea whether they ever made their attempt or not, mm -hmm. but they certainly did not succeed. Tell us just a little bit about the Ustasha that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Who were they and, and why were the Nazis not r uh, running your part of Yugoslavia? Mm -hmm. um, uh, they were actually a, a, a nationalist group that had gathered uh, in Italy before the war. Uh, the, the history of Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, is so complicated, um, and uh, there were so many changes. After World War I, it, it became Yugoslavia. Uh, it was a sort of an almost artificially created country, um, and um, of, because it was the there were so many parts to it. The, um, the main parts were, of course, the Serbia and Croatia. Mm -hmm. And there were nationalists within Croatia who wanted a pure Croatia, and uh, they, an independent Croatia. And so they used the opportunity um, of the war to align themselves with uh, Germany, with Nazis. And, um, and the, in exchange for running the country the way Germany wanted them to, they, uh, they were able to secure um, the right to run it by themselves. So they had their pure country, but it was a puppet state of the Nazis. It was a puppet state of the Nazis, yeah. and you know, they, are, they were basically um, running it the way the Nazis wanted, right. and that include that included everything that the Nazis had already perpetrated since 1938, uh, or earlier even. Uh, certainly, um, all the rules and laws uh, that governed um, within 
Germany and the countries which they had conquered since. Including um, the way they treated Jews, in, especially. In the, the, all the Jewish, all the questions of um, uh, how to treat, how to, you know, how, what was banned to the Jews, um, anything that, uh, that involved any access to public life. Uh, that included uh, whether you sit on a bench in the park, uh, whether you participate in an orchestra, whether you go to school, uh, whether you work, work um, whether you have access to food and shelter, uh, anything uh, was banned. And so the same kind of laws, and of course to wear a badge that identifies you. And so all of that was immediately perpetrated in uh, Croatia. And um, Jews were immediately issued um, uh, uh, ba um, uh, badges, um, and in Croatia, the, some, some of the badges are different in different countries. Right. This one was uh, a yellow, um, silky-looking um, piece of cloth on which there is a, um, a, a Star of David. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a picture I have, and it is on the website of, the, of this museum, so people can see it. Uh, where there are my father, my mother, my aunt, another aunt, and, um, and one of my cousins all wearing these. Um, so, you know, lists of people, everybody had to report. They were starting to, they would take, start taking property away and eventually send people to camps. And of course, as you began to tell us a, a few minutes ago, your parents were arrested, and, and they had your little brother with them at the time, and right. they were sent to a concentration right. camp. I think, I, I will get to my brother, but I do want to say, say that um, one of the things that these Ustashe, with Pavelice, the head, uh, had in mind, they, they, did, they, they persecuted Jews um, as um, part of the whole thing that the Nazis perpetrated. However, they had uh, another goal in addition to the goal that the Nazis had. The Nazis didn't care one way or another about um, a pure Croatia. And pure to, to, these, to the Ustasha meant not just pure of Jews, but also Roma, which the Nazis perpetrated as well, but also pure of Serbs. Now the Serbs are, um, uh, part of, they, you know, there, there are uh, um, members of the, what is now Serbia, but they were, there were many Serbs um, within Croatia. And there was, you know, there was a mixing of the society and they had basically come through the years uh, to live in certain, certain part that under the Austro-Hungarian empire. Uh, so uh, th their idea was uh, to, get rid of the Serbs. So the persecution was not just of the Jews, but, ma but majorly of Serbs. So total ethnic cleansing. Total ethnic cleansing, yeah. Okay. Tell us what happened to your parents and then about your brother as well. So my parents were taken to this, um, basically to the jail uh, gathering place in, um, in Zagreb. And they had my little brother with them who was at that time. Um, I think about nine months old by the time they were taken. I don't know why I remember that number. Um, and they, um, fortunately, um, our housekeeper went there and things were so uh, chaotic and she asked if she can have my, this baby and they just said, sure. And take so, the baby. Take the baby. So my parents handed the baby to her mm -hmm. and then she called, um, uh, at my uncle uh, and my aunt in Ludbreg, and they went and got him. And I have a pretty good memory of his arrival. Uh, and um, I remember him being at my grand grandparents and lying on a bed and crying and crying and crying. I so ha have that memory of this crying baby and wondering what now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and you had already, you were already with Anthony. I was already there. You were there. I was you already there. there, right. Um, 
did you know if your Aunt Geezer or uncle had any idea what happened to your parents at that point? Oh, I'm sure that everybody at that point had Maybe. an idea okay. what was going on, and a lot of people already had an idea, and a lot of people um, started um, fleeing to the mountains, um, not to hide, but to start fighting, so it was the young people many young people. To become par partisans. To become partisans. It was the beginning of the partisan movement mm -hmm. Im almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And so this was the other group. Well, there was this fascist group that had put this, pulled itself together from Italy and come to run the place. Um, at the same time, the, the, basically the Communist Party um, was um, uh, the primary mover of some parts of the partisans, and then other people just um, spontaneously went and joined because they didn't want to. Um, they didn't want to live under this uh, under this system. So here's you and, and your brother now are with your aunt and uncle. Right. In 1942, your uncle Ludovic was arrested, and he was sentenced to the Yasanovets concentration camp. Mm -hmm and you and your brother remained with your Aunt Giza. Tell us about your uncle's imprisonment at Yasanovets, and then what happened as a result of that to you, your, your brother, and Aunt Giza. Well, by the time he was arrested, everybody else was already gone. Mm. Um, um, so the, uh, the first arrest was everybody else in the family, and except for him and his wife. And there were some laws by which he could be shielded, he could shield her um, because it was a mixed marriage. Um, but but at that, by that time, everybody else in the family, my grandparents, my other aunt, everybody had already been arrested. And um, I can go back to that if you want me to. No, please do, but, please do. Um, but, um, uh, but I, 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 and I have a memory of, of their being um, uh, arrested and, and um, escorted. What happened? You, you remember seeing that? I remember seeing that. Um, and this was, of course, um, a sort of a, it, it was nighttime. I, I, I have memory of that. There was everybody carrying packages and. I remember people carrying a pillow and you know a small satchel or something, and everybody saying goodbye to me and my brother. Um, and uh, I had no idea why. Every, lots of people why they were crying and what was going on, but eventually they were gone, and um, and I was left behind, and I was left behind with my brother, and at at Ludva and Giza's house. Mm -hmm. um, and the question always comes up, how, how is that that didn't take me? Right. And um, I think, uh, while I don't know for sure, my thought is that, um, you know, they had, um, the, the, the Ustasha were not as organized by far as the Germans. However, uh, they did follow certain things. For example, they had everybody registering. And you say, well, like, why would you go register? But you know, the the system was such that the police always knew who was living where, mm -hmm. and the Jewish community had, of course, a list of people. Um, and my brother and I had come from another town, so I have a sense that we were not on the infamous list. Mm -hmm. And so they would come when these Ustasha who were leading the raid, who were conducting the raid. Uh, they would come and say, you know, take a list and take this, 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 this. And we were not on the list, so off they went, and we were staying behind. That's the only thing I can I can think of, because everything had been listed ahead of way ahead of time. People had to register all of their worldly goods. Mm -hmm. They had to register every little bit, you know, the how many necklaces you had. You had like little gold necklace or you had a, a, a two pairs of shoes or a coat. It all, Everything's everything was point. registered. And, li and re this kind of registration is actually on, on 
pieces on, on, in forms, their forms, and some of those forms are, you know, here. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so by the time everybody left and we were left by ourselves, uh, just Giza, Ludwa, and I, and my brother, um, life was already very different. And at that point, as you asked me, uh, Ludwa got arrested, and why? Because at that, that, by that point, the, the partisan force had already become a force. And they were fighting the Nazis. They were fighting the Ustasha, and um, uh, the local, the local populace, which was fortunately um, pro-partisan and, and anti-Ustasha, which is why I suppose also we survived because no one gave us. No up. one denounced you. No, the yeah. entire town knew who we were. We were the grand. We, we, my my grandfather was a rabbi in that town for forty years. Everybody knew who we were. So there's no secrets. No there. secrets. Yeah. But these people came from outside, who who led the raids, and we were left behind. And um, so at that point, however, um, many people who were sort of leaders. In, in the city, at, in the town, I shouldn't call it city at any point, small town, um, they were, um, um, they were, the, as many, number of people were accused by the Ustasha of helping the partisans, um, which of course they did, but uh, they were then arrested as, uh, but they didn't admit to it, but that they were arrested as, um, um, they were, arrested as um, uh, supporters of, of, the of the partisans. And therefore, they were sort of political prisoners. Mm -hmm. And political prisoners were treated differently from Jews or Serbs or Roma, in that they actually had some kind of a trial. And they were, or they were given a, a sentence. So Ludwig was given a sentence. And he was, from what I understand, in this uh, awful um, camp of Yasenovats for um, almost a year. So he had a defined sentence. He had a defined sentence. And that's the same camp that your parents were sent to? Yes, it was the same camp. And at that point, my mother, she, my mother was in an auxiliary camp in, and she already passed away by that time, I think. But my father was actually in the camp of Yasenovats and Uncle Ludwa actually saw him there. Mm -hmm. And, um, the situation in Yasenovas was incredibly difficult. It's, you've described it as an especially uh, brutal. It was a brutal. It was a brutal, brutal camp, and um, um, there are some as attempts at revisions sometimes to say it was a work camp, or was a work camp to the death. Mm -hmm. um, it was really a killing camp. Um, in which people were killed in the most brutal of ways and treated in the most brutal of ways. Um, and it was not organized. A lot of people you don't know about Auschwitz where you had um, people separated and then they had ovens and so on. The people were just being killed brutally in any which way, uh, slashed with knives and uh, um, hit with uh, farm implements. I'm told that my, uh, some, by somebody who, who witnessed it that um, my grandfather never even made it inside the camp because he was already elderly and had suffered a, a small stroke. And he, the, somebody just, uh, one of the Ustashi just took a, um, um, one of the, a hoe or something like that, something from a, a farm, farm and farm implement and hit him on the head and that was that. Mm -hmm. And people were uh, hanging all over the place, just all the trees were full and scaffolding and then people were dri thrown into the river. The, the camp is right near the Sava River, the biggest river in Croatia. And, and you know, there are pictures and pictures of bodies floating on the Sava River. It was just an awful place. And your uncle saw your father while he my was My uncle there. saw my father who was uh, working very hard. He was, of course, a young, much younger man. Right. Um, 
and he remembered that my, that my aunt was 15 years older than my mother, and he was 10 years older than she. He was born in 1885, mm. so he was not a young man. And he had come from this family where everybody had died, and most of them of some ailment, some, some, um, of some uh, lung ailment, and he was not so well. So that he would have never survived like my, my father, uh, if not for um, one thing, and that is that, uh, differently from my father, who was made, being made to carry um, bricks and um, work very hard, uh, um, Uncle Ludova had, as I mentioned, been a banker. So they needed somebody in an office, and they put him in an office to run their books. In the camp. In the camp. In the camp. And that is what saved his life, because um, the, he didn't have to work outside in all kinds of weather. Um, and um, so this is how, what helped him to survive. And also, the other thing is that the Ustasha decided they wanted to have some entertainment. And they knew, they found out that he had been leading a choir and put on shows and uh, as an avocation and could play the violin. And so they had him organize um, a, a, a choir and, and an orchestra. And uh, so that gave them also people that he would call to, to be in this uh, choir. Uh, they would give them a few hours of, um, of respite from really, really hard, hard work with, and that's another thing, there was almost no food. Um, and you know they were just subsisting on, um, there are accounts here in the in the museum that I translated where you know people were eating grass and uh, if what there, if there was grass that is when they went out on some kind of you know work detail work detail or something um, it was just really really bad the picture that I that is uh, there of my brother and me with my aunt we sent that we were actually allowed to send him packages and and so we sent this picture and one of the thing that we used to send as packages was um, a mixture of, of fat that, uh, and then you put flour in it, and you made a very, very thick paste of that. A flour and fat. Flour and fat. And so it would be like a, almost like a brick made of flour and fat, and we were allowed to send that. And um, if he got it, um, which was not always, you, you would take a little bit of that and you put it in this water which they gave you, which was called soup, to make it a little bit more nutritious. To give it some calories. Yes. To give it some yes. calories. Dora, while, while your uncle's going through all you've just described, in early 1943, your Aunt Giza, with whom you and your brother were living, was denounced and she was deported to Auschwitz. Um, what happened to Giza? How, what do you remember of that? And then, of course, what happened to you and your brother at that point? I remember um, when they came to get her. Um, I don't remember seeing any people. I just know, knew that there was some emergency happening, and I remember her going. We had a, a, um, a, a building next door to ours. Uh, it was a building that the two sisters and their husbands started building together. And it was supposed to have, it had a store on the bottom and, and, and a little apartment in the back and unfinished apartment upstairs. They had not been finished at that point. And she tried to get up there and hide, mm -hmm. but they found her. And on the way back, she told the family that was living in the small apartment in the back, the Runyak family, she asked them to take care of us and they took us in. Um, they took my brother and, uh, and me in, and um, we started now pretending that they were, we were their children. Um, uh, my aunt was taken to Auschwitz, and when my uncle came back, he tried to follow the, tr the trail, and he found out that she had been taken to Auschwitz, and there was no way of saving her. Mm -hmm. But um, we remained with the Runyak family until he returned. And um, my, I, always, I always knew, because I was old enough at that point, that this was not my mother, and that I was- Mrs. Runyak. Mrs. Runyak, yeah. that I was to call her mother when anybody was present, right. anybody we didn't know. 
but my brother actually, because he was three years younger, he couldn't, he didn't even figure that out. They were nice to him and so he just always called her mother. Mm -hmm. um, and you were just, you were conscious. That I was conscious of what was going on. I, I was conscious that there was, that it was dangerous and that, that I needed to, I needed to um, uh, say that I, this was my mother, yeah. I, I think, I, if, I, if I understand correctly, you only recently learned for, with certainty what happened to Aunt Giza. Uh, right, because um, when the um, when the, um, f uh, uh, the, the the archive from Germany arrived here from uh, from Bad Arlson, um, and that's within the last five or so years. Yes, right? yes, yeah. um, uh, arrived uh, here, and it's it's now the whole all of these records that the Germans had made that were stored in Bad Arlson, they had been digitized, and they are now available. Through this muse, through the museum, we have it. Um, it's not easy to access, and you have to ask somebody to do it. And right. um, so, yeah. but uh, if, if for people, if they have a a name or some something to go by, uh, our researchers are very kind and will try and find mm -hmm. that person. So they actually found my aunt's. Um, the, there is a card that says that she came at such and such time and died at such and such time, very shortly after she arrived, supposedly of intestinal ailments. Right. Yeah. So your your uncle, he because he had a defined sentence. He um, he, he was he, allowed. To, he was he was let to go. The sentence is up. And so did everybody else in Lubrek. All these there were around four or five people that were arrested at the same time, and they were all let go. So he comes back, and as you described, he tried to use his influence to find Giza, but he he couldn't. Absolutely. It was too late. Right. So now it's Uncle Ludovic and, and you and I and, and my brother. Yes. But what happened then? So. Um, uh, basically, just we try to stay low and survive, um, and it was a very difficult time because this was a time of battles between the Ustashe and the Partisans, and uh, the battles were fought all around us and in that town, um, and we uh, we we tried at we, we tried at times to. Um, hide bef uh, before the battles. If we had any inkling that something would be happening, which sometimes we did, we would all we would run uh, into our cellar. And the way to get to the cellar is you had to get out of the house and then down. And we had a vineyard uh, nearby, and uh, and so we had barrels of wine that were kept there. It was a you know a low ceiling. Um, dirt floor, mm -hmm. um, damp, with tiny windows on the top, and shelves full of apples. Apples had to be separated so that they don't, the business of one apple um, Spoiling the spoils rest. the rest, it's true. So the, there were apples, and uh, the vegetables were kept in the winter time um, in sand, sort of carrots and mm -hmm. root vegetables. Um, there were frogs jumping everywhere, mm -hmm. and we uh, had some kind of cots down there. And sometimes we would spend many nights down there because the, the partisans would attack uh, during the night. And then if they didn't win, they would try to withdraw. Uh, because the, where Ludbrecht is situated, it's just at the foot of hills and then mountains. Not very high mountains, but it's mountainous. And so um, sometimes the battle, sometimes we didn't get to, to escape into the, into the cellar and so uh, in, in time. So we would be inside the building, inside the house, and the, you know, bullets would be flying through the windows and you would just, you know, sit in a, try to sit in a corner. This was a house that was built by my, um, by, by Strytrex, by Ludva's, um, Parents, so it was very thick walls. Mm -hmm. So the bullets did not penetrate through the walls, but they would penetrate through windows. You, you told me about an incident you remember with a very close call with your uncle, where uh, a bullet struck where he just was. Tell yes, us. Yes, because I was. Uh, it was one of the battles where um, the um, one Ustasha force, I think, was in. 
our backyard mm -hmm. and the partisans were on the second floor of the house across the way and they were shooting at one another and of course we were in the middle um, and um, I was still lying in, in my bed which was in a very well placed in a corner of, the, of one of the rooms so that it was not near a window and I was crying and I called for my uncle who had come from uh, the next bedroom, which did have a window that would uh, overlook the beds. And so he came to comfort me, and a bullet went straight through the windows right to where his pillow was. So in a sense, I saved his life right. accidentally, yeah. You, Dora, you had said to me that for, you're, you're still a little girl. Mm -hmm. The worst part of that time for you was, quote, living through battles and being afraid of being shot rather than of being deported because right. the being shot was so imminent and real. I mean, yeah. you, you, you could grasp what that meant. Right, being deported meant nothing. I right. mean, just go away. You disappear. You disappear. Um, but being shot was, um, because in the morning when we would get up, we wouldn't know what was happening. Sometimes we'd peer out the little window in the basement and I remember, um, carts going by being pulled by horses full of dead bodies yeah. and the, there was one particular um, time that was a terrible battle on our street that ended up with um, Usashi surrounding the partisan force and they, th they couldn't escape and they threw a bomb among themselves and, um, and uh, uh, were killed. And from then on, that street was called the one of the 17th Brigade um, because the 17th Brigade was, was perished, had perished there. So the, the, that kind of thing, and you know, when, I remember very well when the mill, for example, was burnt, and the partisans burned the mill mm -hmm. uh, because they were trying to get everything away from the Ustashi, any kind of thing that they could sustain themselves with. Of course, this also meant that people who had, there was a mill on the small river we had there, and all, this was in a rural area, and all the people had brought their wheat to be milled, and it's the smell of it and the, the, the fire of it was just horrendous, and I remember that well, and all the people screaming and shouting and being um, very upset, but that was the kind of thing that was going on back and forth with the partisans in the Ustashi. And of course, the war ended in May 1945. And mm -hmm. so, Dora, with the war's end um, in May 1945, you're alone with your brother and Uncle Ludovic. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what did your uncle do then to try to build a life with, with his, his niece and nephew that he was now uh, completely in charge of? Well, for one, we were, we were waiting to see if anybody will return. Mm -hmm. And um, um, no one, no one was coming. Um, people, people would ask me for many years after many years, certainly months and years afterwards, whether I'm still hoping that some, my mother or my father would come back. Maybe there are some place in Russia. I don't know where people had this idea. Did you idea. think they were going to come back? Um, uh, there's always some sense of that, but I, but I really, I lost hope fairly, fairly early. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, so um, the, the only people that did return um, were two of my uncles. Um, on my father's side, um, one uncle was arrested uh, and um, because, well, both of them, one on my mother's side, one on my father's side, were serving in the Yugoslav army when Germany invaded. Mm -hmm. And they were taken by the Germans as prisoners of war. And they both survived, not together, separately, mm -hmm. as prisoners of war. And they both returned, and they came to this town of Ludbreg to see if anybody was there of my mother's family. And they only found me with, uh, with Ludva. Um, by that time, they wanted to have me go with them. Mm -hmm. um, both of them had married almost immediately after the war. Um, and uh, they, um, 
they were both headed for, they, they, one of them married, the other one remarried her, his, his wife, the one who was in the picture with the star and the daughter were both killed. And so he, was, he now married another, a widow with two children, uh, so a war widow. Uh, and so they, they, they were all headed for Palestine, it was before, before Israel became Israel. Um, and they came to, to see me and wanted me to go with them. By that time, I had also, what we hadn't mentioned before, I had, during the war, they, um, they uh, uh, baptized me. And so... I was hoping you might mention that. Yeah, and uh, there was a time that Mrs. Runyak was told that um, uh, if, by the priest, what are we going to do with these children? And if not, you know, something will go with them too. So, Strichik um, acquiesced, and they they um, baptized me. So in order to protect you. To, in order to protect me, and um, whether that worked or not, I don't know. But I'm alive, so it might have worked. Um, uh, so they um, so 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 there was this problem when that the Strichik not only. Um, uh, had um, done that, but also he immediately went ahead and and uh, adopted both my brother and me officially. And so here I was um, now being torn between uh, these two uncles who returned and my uncle with whom I had spent this very difficult, very uh, uh, time, who was extremely kind to me, who was a wonderful, loving, exceptional person mm -hmm. and he loved me and I loved him and so when I was asked by my uh, uncles to go with them they essentially asked me what I wanted to do and I said I wasn't going I was staying with my uncle Ludwig. What a tremendous choice for a young child. It was a choice. At that point by the way by the time I made that choice my brother was no longer that um, in 1946, he contracted scarlet fever. It was right after the war. We did not have a penicillin. Um, he, three, children, three little boys in town um, came down with scarlet fever. Two of them survived. My brother did not. He, mm -hmm. they, the doctor said he must have had a weak heart, but he died within three days of contracting. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a... Tremendous blow to my uncle. He adored my brother. I mean, he adored us both. He, he had really no family now. Um, all of his siblings were dead, his wife. And so it was just um, basically now, by 1947, it was uh, 1946 even, late 1946, it was just he and I. And um, we had um, um, sometimes maids and sometimes we were lucky housekeepers. Uh, who were sort of nannies. Mm -hmm. um, there was one in particular um, who had lost everything also in the war. Um, they had taken away her pension. She had been married to, an, in the olden days, to an Austro-Hungarian officer. So when the communist government came about, that was a sort of a no-no, and they took things away from them Eventually, it was returned, but in the meantime, she came to be um, with us, and um, uh, she was a highly educated lady who um, taught me to play the piano. She was my first piano teacher, my first German language teacher, and um, I became, they, the, the, her family, she had daughter-in-law who was still alive and a granddaughter, and they used to come to Ludbreg. Um, often, and became, we became friends. And this this granddaughter I just visited while I was in Zagreb, and so it was something we kept we kept the friendship going. But that is basically how we lived um, mm -hmm. uh, after the war, and um, um, it was uh, not an easy time for anybody after the war because... In, in Dora, of course, you're under the communist government. Right. And you would stay living there with your uncle until 1957. Tell us about leaving Yugoslavia um, and, and what you did. Well, in 1954, I went out the first time because uh, an uncle 
who survived via Bergen-Belsen, and um, he escaped. Um, he escaped via hung to Hungary and from Hungary uh, with the Kastner train to Bergen-Belsen, and then end up, ended up in Switzerland. They eventually wrote and found they found, found me. Okay. And in 1954, I was allowed actually to go out to visit him. And you have to explain why you were allowed to leave, because you couldn't just leave no, you, communist the countries. No, communist country, you couldn't leave, you couldn't go out at all. And so I was um, um, given a, a title of, I was a victim of fascism, and as a victim of fascism, I was allowed to go out. And I had a um, temporarily. temporarily. Temporarily, I was allowed to go vis to visit, and I got a visa. Um, I was got I got a passport and a visa from the Swiss, which took some time also. And I was allowed to go. And of course, uh, it was also expensive. And fortunately, we still had some um, some things from before the war and so on. Of course, my uncle was now again working as a bank director in town, and so we we had something to still to sell to buy a ticket for me. Um, and I was allowed to take $5 worth of, uh, uh, $5 in foreign currency with $5. Me. Yeah, $5. Even and in 54, that was not a lot of money. Exactly. And so I got on this train all by myself at the age of 16 and uh, went to Switzerland and my uncle was waiting for me at the, at the border. Uh, and um, they also couldn't come. They had no citizenship at that time either. They were just, you know, sort of stateless. And so um, I, for the first time, I saw someone from my family. It was a very emotional moment. Mm -hmm. And then he took me, we went to his house, to his apartment. And um, his wife was there, very lovely, also from, from Zagreb. And um, they had survived the war together. And they had two little children, and it was a wonderful, re wonderful reunion. And um, um, they were very kind, very lovely, and we got along very, very well right away. What was interesting, though, is that they were uh, they were um, religious Orthodox Jews. And I knew absolutely nothing about being, I knew I was Jewish. I always knew who I was. Mm -hmm. uh, I always knew who my grandparents were and so on. But I never understood, I never knew anything about Judaism. Um, in, for one, during the period of communist rule, nobody knew anything about any religion. I mean, people, we certainly didn't, uh, nobody went to, to church, nobody went to synagogue. There were no synagogues. Our, the synagogue in Ludwig was totally destroyed, down to nothing. And um, they, were, they kept horses in there during the war, and then it was totally leveled. Um, there's nothing there now either. To this day? No, to this day. And um, so it was, a, it was an emotional time in, in Switzerland. But we got along very well, and so after a month, I went back, and then they said, "Well, why not come back when I after uh, 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 once I finish high school and I'm at the university?" And so I, um, so I did. So I managed to get. Um, I, I finished high school. It was a um, wonderful high school. I just came back from a 60th reunion. It was a very small academic high school, mm -hmm. and um, I was. I had studied English. Uh, really loved it, so I, uh, so I spent a year at the University of Zagreb as an English major, and then after that year, I went back. I went to Switzerland once again to my aunt, aunt and uncle with the idea of studying French at the University of Lausanne. Mm -hmm. So we're, I think we're going to stop there, and um, I wish that we had more time. I, I think you can tell that we really had to jump over an awful lot. We could have kept you all here this afternoon, and I think you might have liked it. I know I would have. Um, it's our tradition at first person that our first person has the last word, so I'm going to turn back to Dora in a moment and have Dora close the program. When Dora finishes, um, two things. One is Joel will come up on the stage and take a photograph of Dora with you as the background, and so I'm going to ask you to stand at that time. And because we didn't have a chance for you to ask Dora some questions, Dora will remain up on the stage here and we invite you to come up on stage and, and uh, just say hi to her, ask her a question, 
take your picture with her, whatever you'd like to do. We'd like you to do that if you'd like to do so. Um, I, one of the things I regret not having time to get to is, and this might embarrass Dora, but um, when she, how she met her husband um, because she'd learned English overhearing a conversation on a train um, with a, an American, a Russian, I think, and a, a Brit. And, uh, a Yugoslav. A Yugoslav, and, uh, and it's, it is a, actually a wonderful love story. Uh, but we'll, we'll leave that at that. And um, so thank you for being here. We hope you can come back to another first person program each Wednesday and Thursday until the middle of August, and then we'll resume again in 2017. So with that, Dora. Well, I just want to say that I just came back from being in Croatia again, and every time I go, I have this strange sense of um, being at home and not being at home. Being at home because there are friends, people I know, and um, not being at home because the United States has really become my home and I've lived here most of my life and been very happy here. Um, it, it's disturbing sometimes, uh, disturbing sometimes to see how things are not improving in the way that I would like to see them improve. Um, instead of people being aware of how terrible it is when there are wars and um, um, animosities and singling out groups of people to uh, decide that they shouldn't be here or sh they shouldn't be uh, where they want to be or express what they want to express or practice religion they want to practice. It's very difficult for me to see that because of my experience and knowing how hurtful and how um, useless such behavior is. So both in Europe and the United States now, I find language that I find hurtful and upsetting. And in Europe, it's sort of sometimes as if they had forgotten what they went through. And here I think we should also remember the language we use, the thing, the sentiments we express that might be hurtful to others. So this is what I'm leaving everyone with. Tolerance, sense of the importance of human spirit, and um, goodwill to all men. And thank you for being here. Mm -hmm.